Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Dr. Lucy Jones, the 2019-2020 Wayne Morse Chair of Law and Politics at the University of Oregon. She's a research associate at Caltech's Seismological Laboratory. She's also the founder of the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society and the author of The Big Ones, How Natural Disasters Have Shaped Us and What We Can Do About Them. Jones completed 33 years of federal service with the U.S. Geologic Survey in 2016. Most recently, she was the USGS Science Advisor for Risk Reduction. She led the development of the earthquake drill, the Great Shakeout, which included 63 million participants in 2018. As Wayne Morse Chair, Jones was in residence at the UO October 7th to November 5th, 2019. During her time on campus, she gave talks in Eugene and Portland, participated in a class, and met with local officials on disaster preparedness issues. Thanks, Lucy, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So welcome back to you today. <laughs> you were here uh, as a guest of the OHC in March of 2017. Right. What have you been up to for the past two years? Oh, so much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been fun. Yeah. Uh, I uh, finished writing my book, the, the big ones. Uh, had it released, had the book tour and all the discussions around that. Um, I officially started the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society, which is um, uh, a, an active nonprofit working with cities and community organizations and scientists trying to connect all those people and figure out how to do a better job of, uh, uh, of engagement between those groups. Uh, and then I've also, with uh, more control of my own time, returned to uh, musical passions that I uh, had had to put to the side for a while. Uh, so I'm playing the viola da gamba, a Renaissance predecessor of the cello, and in various groups, and uh, and actually been composing for it too. So I'm I'm keeping myself very busy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. So um, you've mentioned the establishment of the of the Jones Center for Science and Society. What provoked you to undertake that project? Why, did, why was that an important thing for you to do? Okay, the, the, that's actually a big fundamental philosophical question. Mm -hmm. If you look at American society, and actually I don't think it's confined just to America, we have scientists that engage in research. And scientific research is a process of understanding, figuring out what's actually true. Mm -hmm. We believe in objective reality, mm -hmm. and good science is a better approximation of that reality. The thing about researchers is we spend a lot of time in that space where we don't know, right? Being wrong. Once it's completely settled and we actually know what's really true, we're no longer interested and we move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. On the other part of society, we have people who need that information to make better decisions. And in the changing climate, uh, that's becoming a much more critical function. But, you know, a city or a county that's going to be trying to decide what's the appropriate adaptation they need to undertake or how can they reduce their contribution to the climate change, they, don't, they aren't gonna hire research scientists <laughs> and they've got to try and figure out from this research work what actually applies to them. And there's this space in between of tr a translation process. How do we take this science and actually take action on it, on this other part? And we don't populate that space in between. And um, it's a, you know, we've, we've, we don't fund it <laughs> and we don't really respect it. The research endeavor tends to say that's somebody else's job and the, the policy side says, I, I, I don't have those skills, tell me what I'm supposed to listen to. And so I, it's my very small effort to try and be in that space and do a better job of connecting those two sides. So I think when, when people like me hear you talk about that space, I know you sometimes call it a no man's land, <laughs> um, we think, okay, well the people that occupy that space are like science communicators. They do science communication. And I know that you, this term science communication is one that you're skeptical of. You use a different term, science I, activation, you call it. What right. is that? Uh, it's going a bit beyond communication. Mm -hmm. Communication is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Scientists fundamentally communicate in a different way than the rest of the world for good reason. Mm -hmm. It's part of that peer review exploration process, but it tends to leave out the rest of the world. And, but communication is inherently a unilateral process. It says, I have information or we have information over here and we need to figure out how to get it over here. We're still handing off the information. 
And what I have found in my own experience is that going farther than that, actually engaging with the policymakers to explore what that information means allows it to be used much more effectively. So I've started using the term science activation to mean a bilateral process mm -hmm. where I'm not just handing over information, but really working to empower the policymakers to use that information effectively. It's often, especially the complex things like ecosystems or climate, it's very complex information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's not that easy to just pick it up and use it. And, and I, I think we need more. But most scientists don't have the skills to do it because we're actually actively trained to do other mm -hmm. <laughs> than what are the appropriate ways. I mean, we know that we have to avoid stories. You know, the plural of anecdote is not data. Mm -hmm. we, we know and we have it beaten into us. You never use a story because that's just misleading. Mm -hmm. Of course, for most policymakers to engage people and make the decision to actually act on something, mm -hmm. we need the stories to give us the emotional, experiential connection that allows us to really process the information. So that's just one example of that place in between. So we have to actively train scientists to do that. And that, in fact, is one of the three main things I'm, I'm trying to do with my center is provide training for scientists. So I, I've done a couple of workshops at Caltech. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually teaching a course at Caltech in the, in the winter mm -hmm. on science activation. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's something 20 years ago Caltech would go, are you kidding me? This mm -hmm. isn't what we do. Um, we proposed the workshop. We had three times as many students apply as we could take because especially the younger generation of scientists sees what's at stake. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why do you think we've gotten to a place where, I mean, for years and years and years, scientists were like, you know, po policies over there, we do our jobs. Right. And things have changed in the United States. So science, science is, is under scrutiny and attack, and scientists are. So the march on, the, the science march on Washington, right. right? This is unprecedented event, all these scientists getting this message. Yep. What's going on? Why is that happening? Why, why is science coming under this attack? Why are people so skeptical of it? Well, uh, there's a couple of things. One, I th I mean, there has explicitly been an active attempt to undermine science for commercial gain. Mm. Right? It, hap it began with cigarettes. How do we make people not believe that really in con you know that science as the evidence built and built and built? Mm -hmm. um, that also taught people techniques. And some of the same thing has been happening with climate change, ways of undermining it. And I think that part of that is, is crass commercialism on the part of some people. Mm -hmm. um, there is another piece that I would put more on the scientists mm -hmm. that we thought it's okay to sit in our corner and uh, it's somebody else's job. I don't have to think about that. I'm a pure academic. And that is absolutely what we valued you know, you get promoted because you've published papers in good journals and they get cited by other scientists in good journals, right? That's the definition of success. And if you actually work on policy, it can actually be, or has been, a significant demerit. If you're spending time on that, you're not spending time on those important papers mm -hmm. that you should be writing. Um, and as I move to do more of that in the USGS, I mean, luckily as a government agency, I had, um, I mean, I got my top promotion level, the top available in 1993. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't much of a motivator for me for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. and, and so I could make other choices. But you've got a culture that still says that's what really matters. And I definitely was, I got significant pushback about doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, there's all of that sort of scientific endeavor that, that just says that's not our job and not valuing it. And that's something, it's starting to shift, um, and I, very exciting that the, the National Academy of Sciences is preparing a report, it should be out soon, that says how to use policy work by your faculty as a part of the promotion tenure evaluation. Mm. And having the National Academy of Sciences say this is important and we think you should value this is gonna help a lot. Um, but cultures take a long time to change. You need people, you know, in some cases, people have to die <laughs> to, 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 to move on from that. I'll add one third thing. So take these two things that we've sort of been too much off in our corner. There's been some explicit uh, activity to undermine it. 
And then I think fundamentally the nature of the relationship between information and, and society has shifted mm -hmm. because of the internet, mm -hmm. right? It used to be, without the internet, somebody had to decide it was worth the money to publish a book. You had editors that spent time saying, this is worth listening to. And most of the information that came out was, was pretty solid. Or, you know, I mean, you've got all your academic debates and da da da, but there was still a process by which we said this is worth looking at because it costs too much to print a book. Um, with the internet, there's no cost involved in putting out information, mm -hmm. and we are being drowned in information, and it can be complete nonsense. You can put out anything you want there, and you get a good web designer, it looks just as good as something coming out of the New York Times, and. Um, so, and I realized that what scientists do is that we, we don't expect to be able to research everything that we believe. Well, nobody has time in life for that. Mm -hmm. We have shorthands, we have process by which we look and say, you know, like this organization, uh, I'm gonna be more suspicious of and I'm gonna check out whether or not this is really worth it. You know, and it's coming out of Berkeley or it's coming out of Harvard, you go, okay, that's probably more valid. Um, at the same time, you know, there are people who have uh, engaged in active scientific fraud out of some very big name institutions, mm -hmm. but there's still a process to, to eventually find them out. So it's not perfect, but there is a process. And we develop shorthands because you can't handle the flood of information otherwise. But we don't teach this to other people, mm -hmm. right? And maybe, oh, I, I could say science, I could also just say academics, right? Researchers, whatever you're researching, uh, critical thinking, cr critical reasoning. But we don't teach it that way. We teach science in high school as a bunch of facts that you're supposed to memorize because and believe because the expert told you it's true. And you can't maintain that expert facade in, in the era of the internet. Now we also have things going on in society that are even more actively undermining the idea of truth or that there is truth. Mm -hmm. um, won't dive into that. Uh, so we have to, I think we fundamentally need to change how we teach science. It's beginning, I don't know if you've heard of the next generation science standards, they're starting to be adopted around the country and they're really more about process. One way to think about this is that, you know, go back a thousand years in, in Western society, we don't, um, you didn't need to read. You got, if you needed reading, you got a specialist, the scribe to come in and do it, you know, even if you're the king. Mm -hmm. The advent of the printing press changed that dynamic and made reading a skill that was now needed by everybody. Not, I mean, obviously some people don't read and you could still have a job in you know, the industrial era without uh, being able to read, but you couldn't really participate in society without it. And I'd argue that the internet, that technical development, is doing the same thing with scientific skills. Mm -hmm. That ab ability to analyze the significance of data and, you know, the validity of data and its significance. That's sort of a fundamental scientific skill. And I'm arguing everybody needs it now and mm -hmm. we're gonna need to really change our educational process. There's another cultural issue that takes time and there's always a lot of disruption when you get big technological shifts because it takes time for human society to catch up. Hmm. Fascinating. So as part of these efforts that you're alluding to about transforming education in the face of this, the, the University of Oregon has a new media center for science and technology, which is housed in the School of Journalism and Communication, and its aim is to connect science and society through new models of science communication. And one of the places on our campus where storytelling is what they talk about is in the journalism school. So right. the first thing is to say a little bit about the kind of cultural differences between journalists on the one hand and scientists on the other. Uh, and then, you know, how can collaboration between these groups be helpful in these kinds of projects that you're talking about? The fundamental of collaboration is understanding where the other side's coming from, right? So for a scientist, uh, a story is, is an anecdote, potentially misleading, it doesn't really tell you anything. Right? Because, because there's plenty of stories that aren't true, mm -hmm. right? And we've got it, we've developed our whole skill set about how to recognize that. And of course, to a journalist, the story's how you connect with people, and it's a much more engaging thing. 
You know, actually, when writing my book, the, the big ones, I ended up telling the stories of natural disasters as a mechanism for explaining the science. Mm -hmm. I, part, I was being driven. I wanted people to understand these things, but you, the story, what you need to keep people engaged. So I, I've already sort of dealt with that stress. I found it really hard. I was writing about the Lisbon earthquake and the fact that it happened during the Mass on All Saints Day. And to talk about the candles being thrown over and lighting the, the altar cloths and the old prayer books and imagine the fear of the people trapped in that church. And I'm like, I don't know that that happened. Is it really okay to say mm -hmm. this? It was very, it was one of those, oh, wait a minute, that's that science boundary. Mm -hmm. right. There's another important thing is that for scientists, conflict is what we do every day. That is that process by which we figure out what's true. We have recognized that the easiest person to fool is yourself. Confirmation bias is a big deal. And is, if anything, worse in scientists than others because we think data matters. So we are not the best uh, judges of the data we've created. And we've developed the peer review process to hand it to a competitor and ask them to trash it. Right? It's an emotionally very difficult thing. There's a lot of people who leave research because it's just too stressful and unpleasant to be our, <laughs> asking to be attacked all the time. Um, and that's just how we do our job. And the story comes when we've reached consensus. When we've agreed and we stop fighting some piece of data that's so overwhelming you can't argue against it or some model that so beautifully explains a suite of data and then it's like, oh, wow, there it is, because you're no longer fighting. To the journalist, the conflict is usually the story, mm -hmm. right? The fact that people are in conflict is a thing that you're trained as journalists, and then you give both sides. If there really are two even sides, it's not science that's ready for any mass consumption yet. Should we be talking about it? Um, and there's another part where I think the universities have to look at their role. They are pushing scientists to get press on, store, on re research very early in the process. You know, even, even a paper in Science Magazine mm -hmm. could well end up not proving to be true because it's a process that goes on for years as the people who disagree think of some other way to test it and come up with some other paper. It's by the time it really should be news, nobody's interested anymore. And even worse, we get pressure to do press releases on papers going to conferences. Mm -hmm. When you're at a conference, you've, you haven't even started the peer review process. That's your first attempt to, to, to shop the idea to your colleagues. Lots of papers presented at conferences never make it to press because they turned out to have big flaws. Mm -hmm. And yet we are doing press releases and press events and press conferences because it's good for the professional society, it's good for the university, it's good for the funder, I would just argue it's not very good for the public. Mm. Because what happens is this year's story is A, somebody at the conference goes, that's crap, I'm gonna go, and I, and I take another way of looking at it, no, the answer is B. And the first person goes, hey, you're undermining me, I'm gonna research again, and now we either get back to A or maybe we go to C, right? And it's Every one of those is showing up in the news. We are giving a subliminal message that the scientists always change their mind because mm -hmm. we're doing it too early in the process. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what the solution is to that, mm -hmm. but I think being aware that that isn't what serves the public. Mm -hmm. And how do we get stories about what we finished mm -hmm. that when maybe there isn't as much interest, but it really is where you should be using it. Mm. Hmm. Oh, fascinating. That is a serious challenge. You're here uh, as the Morse Chair talking about resilience. And you've said that natural hazards are inevitable, but natural disasters or human disasters are not. How do you mean? Explain I that. mean, we cannot stop what the Earth is going to do. The fault is going to move, the shaking is going to arrive here, the volcano is going to erupt. But what happens to us is not inevitable. What that shaking does depends on how we build our building. Mm -hmm. What that volcano does to us depends what we put around it. Now there's some level at which we, you know, we're not gonna walk away from California. <laughs> we're not gonna walk away from anywhere near the subduction zone here in Cascadia. Um, 
but we can think about how we build our structures and and we have to think about how we modify our structures mm -hmm. especially as the climate crisis is increasing the rate of of atmospheric disasters mm -hmm. we have to treat it in a different way and and even when you're not changing go look at the earthquake uh, when you know things were built in Oregon before 1990 earthquakes weren't taken into account so now we know we're gonna have an earthquake but it's some time off in the future maybe a long time in the future maybe tomorrow and you have buildings you know are gonna fall down and how do you deal with them and it's you know we've been dealing with that a bit more in California because we have earthquakes more often and have mm -hmm. to face it a bit more clearly but we still have the same issues um, and basically it's like some buildings are so bad, they're so certain to kill people, yes, we're gonna force their owners to, to change those. The worst ones are brick buildings or what's called unreinforced masonry, brick or stone that's holding up the roof. And you know, you, they, here in Oregon, I'm recognizing that there are a lot of those buildings out there and we know they will kill people in this earthquake. Mm -hmm. So now how do you find the policy place to move forward? Um, and then you have to, you know, balance <laughs> your issues what's you know maybe it's much more important to deal with what's coming with climate change probably it is in a place like Oregon where the earthquakes are farther apart mm -hmm. hard to say as a seismologist but don't go deal with your earthquake issue and ignore your climate crisis I, you told the story of how your son who who um, is a well tell the story, okay, tell the story. So, <laughs> yeah so my uh, my son I, I'll be very proud of this he's he's now going into climate science and I realized that he's being driven by the same things that drove me to do seismology 40 years ago because that's a need of society. And we were talking as he's you know, in grad school and he, we were on, and he was like, Mom, I have the feeling that uh, the more you learn about earthquakes, the less frightening they are. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, you know, I really think that's true. I, Paul Slovak tells us all the things that make, a, uh, make us overestimate the risk and basically we can check off all of those with earthquakes. So yeah, the more I know, the less frightened I am. And he was like, you know, the more I learn about climate science, the more frightened I am. And he's gotten me to really look more at what's coming. And I look at the comparative risk. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and again, Paul Slovic's work tells us, because we're predicting climate change, that makes it less frightening mm -hmm. and makes us less likely to take action. Mm -hmm. It's also, we need exper the experience of things. And we have the experience of earthquakes, at least if we're in California. I think it's one of the challenges here in Oregon. You don't have enough experience mm -hmm. to really grab onto that. Mm -hmm. um, but climate change seems far off. So what if the polar bears are having trouble? Um, and that's something actually that's shifting right now yeah. with the fires yep. that, are, that are happening both here in Oregon and in California. Um, and those are a crisis that's gonna require some pretty big shifts. Every ecosystem in the world right now is experiencing a different climate than it was evolved for. Mm -hmm. And that means that the, the ecologies have to shift because the climate's shifting. And the usual way that ecologies shift is through wildfires. You burn down the old stuff and something new comes back in. And um, if we then have human habitation, that's how we go from the natural hazard to the natural disaster. And to say, you can't live in the forest anymore, it's just too dangerous. Are we ready to go there? Maybe, you know, we need to, or say, if you're gonna be there, you're not gonna get protection. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you do that one? And there's another fundamental American problem. We didn't used to pay for disaster relief. We, we, there was actually a point at which the government said, it is immoral to take money collected from everyone through taxes and give them to an individual. They don't deserve to get all that, and, and we just don't do it. Um, really big disasters began with the 1927 Mississippi flood. We've started moving towards more and more. We now have FEMA, we do disaster relief, we have support. But we, when you aren't giving relief, you could say it's your choice to decide what to do. Mm -hmm. Now we're giving relief, which means we are subsidizing bad decisions. And we haven't finished the process <laughs> of resolving that conflict. Hmm. So this is the, that's that's another one of these philosophical conversations that we've been having. So 
Um, I happen to know that you've been teaching a class while you've been uh, at the Morse Chair. Why don't you tell us about that class? It, it's a course for the incoming uh, graduate students, all the first year graduate students in environmental studies. And it's funny, I, I, I saw ENVS, I sort of went environmental science, mm -hmm. and it's not that. Mm -hmm. Environmental studies approaches it from a lot of places. So I came in talking about the ideal of the interaction between scientist and policy, where my job is to make sure that the policymaker understands the implications of his decisions, not to make decisions for him. And getting challenged in the face of this climate crisis, can you really justify that? Can you just leave them to make bad decisions? Well, um, and, and it becomes a very, I've been engaged in a lot of discussions with these students that have really pushed me to think about this issue. Um, and again, especially with respect to the climate crisis, because I'm not a climate scientist. If I were still in the U.S. Geological Survey, I would not be talking publicly about this because I'm not an atmospheric scientist. Mm -hmm. And yet, also, what society needs doesn't need the researcher to tell them. It's the part that's already settled. It's the stuff that my son is taking in his first year graduate seminar. Here's what we already know on which you build your um, research. What we already know is not well enough understood by the policymakers. And so that translation process or activation process doesn't need the experts. I can be talking about it, but I also, as a scientist, it's really clear to me that what's it's potentially at stake is human society. We've let it go far enough, and if we do nothing, we're going to famine, we're going to water availability crises. We're going to sea level rise that are wiping out whole areas. All three of those are going to force people to choose between moving and dying, and they're going to move. Mm -hmm. And we are then going to be dealing with refugees at a, at a scale that we aren't dealing with our current level. How, you know, are we going to end up in world war? Well, that's really starting to look like what's at stake. How can I sit in my my intellectual corner. I, I complain about other people who are farther down the corner, and I've moved more into the middle, but, you know, have I gone far enough? I haven't figured that one out, and I'm being challenged by it. Well, <laughs> I think being the Morse chair is a good way of uh, grappling with these things and sharing what you know with us. Um, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thanks again for coming again to the University of Oregon. I'm sure we'll see you here many times in the future. I'm hoping to be back. Okay, Thank thanks you. for talking to us. I've been speaking with Dr. Lucy Jones, the 2019-2020 Wayne Morse Chair of Law and Politics at the University of Oregon. She's a research associate at the Caltech Seismological Laboratory. She is also the founder of the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society and the author of The Big Ones, How Natural Disasters Have Shaped Us and What We Can Do About Them. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>